All right, so we have a packed plan today. So I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, with our webinar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who do not yet know me, my name is Marley Furman. I'm the project manager at Akoya for HRSA's Do Nation campaign. A few housekeeping reminders before we begin. First, this meeting is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please disconnect now. Additionally, please keep cameras off and mics muted unless you are presenting or asking a question during the designated periods during the webinar. You are welcome to type comments and questions into the chat at any time. Jenna Cavanaugh, president of Akoya, will be helping manage the chat today. Now, I'd like to introduce Lauren Derensberg from HRSA's Division of Transplantation to kick off today's webinar. Thank you so much, Marley, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Health Resources and Services Administration's April webinar for the Donation Campaign, Scorecard Superstars, National Donate Life Month 2024. Today's webinar will feature presentations that model and inspire creative approaches to celebrating National Donate Life Month, and will also help partners earn recognition from HRSA. We have a special guest speaker with us today who will share her experience with Living Donation. I'm Lauren Derensberg, the lead public health analyst with the Division of Transplantation at HRSA. And of course, we're also joined by our Akoya team members, Marley and Jenna. HRSA's Health Systems Bureau is our nation's unifying voice for organ, eye, and tissue donation. By creating a larger, more diverse don donor pool, we can help more people find matches for life-saving transplants. The donation campaign contributes to this goal by cultivating a workplace culture that is supportive of organ, eye, and tissue donation and encouraging workplaces in all industries to sign up their employees and patrons as donors. By extending campaign participation to all workplaces and prioritizing donor outreach in underrepresented communities, donation underscores HRSA's commitment to inclusivity and diversity. We ask the organ don donation professionals here today to help grow donation and sign up new organ, eye, and tissue donors by recruiting both hospital and non-hospital workplaces as campaign partners. Thank you all for making time in your busy schedules for today's webinar. It should be a great session, and we're very grateful for your ongoing support and involvement in donation. We're going to begin today's webinar by spotlighting new campaign materials that partners can access now and in the coming months. We will also share an update on the status of the 2024 Workplace Challenge to enroll new non-hospital workplaces. Then we'll have Donate Life America share their ideas for National Donate Life Month activities that you can conduct to earn scorecard points. Next, we will hear from Maureen Ryan, a living kidney donor, to learn what inspired her to give the gift of life and how your organ donation outreach can inspire even more living kidney donors. And finally, we'll hear from Kyla Harris about how LifeLink of Georgia is helping donation partners in their area achieve recognition from HRSA through the donation campaign. Now I'm gonna hand it back over to Marley to get started with today's presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I'd like to start with a quick update on the 2024 Workplace Challenge for Organ Donation Professionals. The goal of the challenge is for organ, eye, and tissue donation organizations to enroll new non-hospital workplaces in the donation campaign. Currently, 11 donation organizations have entered the challenge by enrolling at least one partner in their area for a total of 34 first-time non-hospital participants so far this campaign year. We are so excited to see the range of workplaces that are getting involved in donation. We have department stores, schools, fraternal and service organizations, media companies, and many more. One of the biggest lessons we've learned since the rebranding to donation is that any workplace in any industry is a good fit for donation. The key is finding an advocate at the workplace, someone with a personal connection to organ, eye, and tissue donation, for example, who can lead the effort. To find these people, we recommend starting with your vendors, 
businesses you frequent, or anywhere else that you can build on an existing relationship and have a heartfelt conversation. National Donate Life Month is a great time for recruiting not only new organ, eye, and tissue donors, but also new partners to the campaign. By using the donation campaign to expand your donation organization's reach, we can improve donation and transplantation rates across the country. To help support your outreach, both virtually and in person, Donation has several resources, including our new National Donate Life Month graphics, animation, and poster, all of which match DLA's theme that donors are superstars. We encourage you to print and hang the poster in public areas, share the graphics in emails and on social media, or even print and distribute them while encouraging donor signups in person. You earn points for conducting each of these activities. To supplement the National Donate Life Month resources, we also have donation themed print and digital rack cards to use at tabling events, videos you can share that explain how to sign up as a donor or get involved in the campaign, and many more materials all available in the Outreach Materials Library on organdonor.gov. Be sure to check out the Donation Campaign YouTube playlist to explore our shareable resource videos and check out the rest of the HRSA2 content while you're there. Even though National Donate Life Month is top of mind right now, we are also prepared for May with new social media graphics and messaging for Older Americans Month and Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. There are more than 10,000 people of Asian American, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander heritage on the waiting list and 93% need kidneys. 70,000 patients on the waiting list are aged 50 years or older. Keep an eye out for our e-blast sharing statistics like these and the graphics you see here to raise awareness of the crucial need for more donors. Every graphic you share earns you five scorecard points for each platform you share it on, and those points add up. The average American spends two hours and 25 minutes on social media per day. Sharing organ donation education and social media activism is a low effort way to reach many people and increase awareness of the need for donors. Combine these lower scorecard, lower effort scorecard activities like sharing graphics with events and direct outreach to maximize your scorecard points without burning out. Donation's Pathway to Recognition worksheets map out an example of a balanced path to earning points with the fewest number of activities required. Find it in the Outreach Materials Library on organdonor.gov. Now, I am pleased to hand the mic over to Hillary Klein, VP of Communications and Registry Operations at Donate Life America. She will tell you about the resources and support available from DLA to support your campaign efforts. She'll also be speaking about Donate Life Living Donor Day. Hillary, take it away. Thank you, Marley. Um, you guys hear me okay? Oh. Hillary, you are on mute. I am not on mute. <laughs> I can hear you, Hillary. You're not on mute. I can hear can you. Okay. I can hear you. Okay, shoo. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, everyone can hear but me. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, Marley. Um, so um, thanks, everybody. Thanks for that introduction. And I'm excited that um, to see those resources uh, for May. So thanks for sharing those with everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all today. I know and thank everyone for making time today. I know we are day three of National Donate Life Month, and many of you are very busy with those. I think I just got muted. Am I back? Now you okay. are, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to thank you all for making time today. I know how busy, I know how busy your days are, period. And I know in National Donate Life Month, everyone is doing extra. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Donate Life Month and the history and then this year's themes along with different resources to um, support your outreach and some fun activities um, for the month. Next slide, please.
Um, in case you're not familiar with Donate Life America, I just wanted to give uh, just a quick um, kind of introduction to the organization. We were founded in 1992 by the donation and transplantation community. This actually, we were born out of UNOS. Um, Dr. Wolf, who was the medical director there at the time, recognized the need for one uniting brand for the cause um, of donation. There were 50 plus OPOs, 250 plus transplant programs. It's a lot for the general public to keep track of and needing to unify everyone um, around that national brand for the cause. And that's where the brand of Donate Life um, came from. Uh, we're made up of, uh, uh, we work with national organizations and Donate Life state teams. Oh, can you go back one, Marley? Thank you. Um, directing national outreach and education to increase organ, eye, and tissue donation. We work across um, organ, eye, and tissue. So welcome if there are any uh, eye banks or tissue bank folks or folks who work in all three. Um, and we own and operate the National Donate Life Registry and the National Donate Life Living Donor Registry, which is currently being piloted in, in the state of Texas. And we also develop multimedia campaigns to educate about donation and promote donor registration. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a quick visual of kind of where we sit in the landscape of donation and transplantation. Our main focus, as I said, we were created to talk to the public as that brand for the public. What we also know is that working and collaborating with professionals and creating resources for professionals to do that local and regional outreach um, to build networks of trust is so vital. We also, as the national um, organization for um, the cause of donation, have that opportunity to work with amazing national partners that really help reach people where they are. So we're talking about Apple. You can register through your iPhone health app. Android users, we're working on it, bear with us. Um, and we also have a great partnership with Walgreens who um, includes the opportunity to register in their Walgreens app several times a year. And they've already registered more than 20,000 people. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's get into Donate Life Month. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history, the theme and the celebrations, and then some resources and promo items. If you're still looking for things, we'll show you where to find them and make it really easy. Next slide, please. Um, Donate Life Month was uh, established by Donate Life America and partnering organizations in 2003. So Donate Life Month is more than 20 years old. Um, it's observed in April and widely celebrated. Um, for folks who haven't seen, I'll drop the link in the chat, but the um, White House Donate Life Month proclamation for this year uh, came out a few days ago, thanks to um, our wonderful colleagues at HRSA who work to make that happen each year as well. Um, we, and of course, the goal of Donate Life Month is to help raise awareness about donation, encouraging Americans to register as organ and tissue donors and to honor those that have saved lives through the gift of donation. Next slide, please. The theme for this year's National Donate Life Month are donors are superstars. Um, and we realized this uh, idea actually came from the community. So if you have a chance to fill out your National Donate Life Month surveys at the end of April, early May, please know we read all of them. And that really inspires and informs us in choosing the theme each year. We had folks from every stakeholder group within the donation and transplantation community recommend something with stars. And this is where we landed with donors are superstars. And it turns out that April is actually one of the best times of the year to stargaze. And as some of us will be able to see on April 8th, there's a solar eclipse. So we really feel like we're in line with the overall uh, celestial universe this year. Um, and I know several, I think actually LifeLink, who's uh, going to talk later, some of the LifeLink OPOs are doing an event around um, the solar eclipse on the 8th with kind of Donate Life branded eclipse glasses, which is awesome. Um, so we invite everyone this April to look up at the night sky and the billions of stars that make up the universe because stars remind us that even in the darkest night, there is light. And we believe that donors give hope and light to those waiting on the national transplant waiting list. And that's why donors are superstars. Next slide, please. I also want to encourage folks, I like to kind of have a conversation and presentation. So if you have questions come up, there'll be time at the end, but feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll 
answer them as I can, um, as I go, as long as time allows. Um, there is, we put together a, a calendar for the month of April because National Donate Life Month includes many celebrations, including Donate Life Living Donor Day. That is always the first Wednesday of April. So this year, um, that's today. Happy Donate Life Living Donor Day. Um, the Blue and Green Spirit Week starts April 6th and ends with National Donate Life Blue and Green Day on April 12th. And National Pediatric Transplant Week um, is April 21st to the 27th. We also included Volunteer Appreciation Week um, on the calendar because we know there's so many activities to thank our wonderful volunteers and ambassadors during the month. I also wanna call out that April 30th is AOPO's Donor Remembrance Day. And that's an incredible day um, to include in your outreach and celebrations as well. I know Satari from AOPO is on the call. So Satari, if you wanna drop that link in the chat for folks too, just wanted to make sure to include that beautiful day. Next slide, please. So a little bit more in depth on a National Donate Life Month celebrations. Donate Life Living Donor Day um, is today. And uh, Donate Life Blue and Green Spirit Week, which kind of guides you. This uh, Spirit Week started in 2020, uh, for the folks who remember, uh, when the world went upside down in March 2020, we were all uh, had to really pivot for Donate Life Month. Uh, coming up in April. And one of the things that we came up with was this Blue and Green Spirit Week to help kind of guide people. That year, it was things you could do at home. People across the community and the public loved it so much. We've continued doing it each year to kind of help people have a guide on different activities for that week that really builds up to Donate Life Blue and Green Day. So dressing up your pets, making blue and green treats, thanking your healthcare heroes, writing a message of hope to those waiting, um, Donate Life Flag Raising Day, um, creating Donate Life Rocks, and of course, National uh, Donate Life Blue and Green Day, and then um, National Pediatric Transplant Week. Next slide, please. So Donate Life Living Donor Day, this is our newest National Donate Life Month celebration. It started in 2021 and it celebrates living organ and tissue donors. Um, so living kidney and liver donors um, from Oregon, and then also celebrating birth tissue donors um, on the tissue side. Um, for those who aren't as familiar, placenta and amniotic membrane um, uh, tissues, grafts that are made from that tissue helps wounds heal. It's amazing. Um, so we are also trying to educate around um, birth tissue as well. And we have seen, as always, the public is always ahead of us. I think the public was ready for more information and celebration of living donors, um, and they let us know. And we created this um, uh, celebration during National Donate Life Month to specifically recognize um, amazing living donors. So these are two of the resources that are available for today, this graphic as well as the infographic. Next slide, please. Donate Life Blue and Green Day. Um, this is just always a tremendous, tremendous day. And we love to see how people participate and are so incredibly creative with this day. We also, here are some examples. We run a national photo contest each year. And these are some of the photos that come in from our incredible clinical partners, from the public, from the DMV. Last year's theme, if you remember, was a, a pond theme. So there were a lot, a lot of frogs. Um, everyone lights up in blue and green in their local areas just incredible stuff. There's Donate Life Texas in the center there. Um, next slide, please. Um, and these are some of our incredible clinical partners. That's um, University Transplant there on the top uh, right and NYU Langone right beneath them and some other amazing clinical partners who really go all out on Blue and Green Day. Next slide, please. Beautiful. National Pediatric Transplant Week. I just want to draw attention to this as this is really a partnership event. This was started in partnership uh, between DLA, UNOS, ASTS, AST, and transplant families. Um, really, I have to thank Melissa McQueen and Joseph Hillenberg from Transplant Families who really were the catalyst in founding this week. And it's been just a tremendous outpouring um, both from both donor families as well as recipients and recipient families to um, educate around the specific needs of 
pediatric transplant recipients and the specific losses around losing a child who's a pediatric donor. I also wanna thank SRTR each year. They create this great infographic, really talking about the specific um, information and education around um, pediatric transplantation. Beautiful. Okay, so those are some of the celebrations and a little showcase of the resources. This is where to find them. You can find them on dlacommunity.net, which is the portal for professionals in the community. You can also find a selection of these resources on the public site um, at donatelife.net. And these are little helpful hints on where to find all of the resources that are easily downloadable. Next slide, please. Some of those resources um, include that can help just inform your outreach and activities, these celebrations calendar, observance flyers, note squares, web banners, TV monitor graphics um, that can be adapted if you're putting them on your uh, computer monitors um, around hospitals. And of course, Zoom backgrounds, as you can see, here I am um, in the night sky. Uh, most of all these resources are also available in English and Spanish. Next slide, please. Um, that next slide when it comes is going to show us the social media graphics that are available. And again, these are both downloadable. Um, there we go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, on our um, public site, as well as the community site for social media folks who may work in social media or who want to let your social media folks know, there's also a Donate Life community content calendar um, where we list out content recommendations for the month and link to graphics just to make that all um, helpful as you build your own content calendars for the month. Um, the graphics are customizable. Um, so if you're just adding your logo um, or your Donate Live State team or your organization logo, you can go ahead and do that. If you need further customization, next slide, please. Um, you can contact this amazing person on the DLA staff, Lauren Squares, who can help um, with any customization requests that you have. Next slide, please. Um, you can also find a press release that's customizable, a proclamation in case you need that for your state or your town, um, the national data story fact sheet, so you can keep, as you're doing media outreach or creating your own um, information packets, um, this is a, a fact sheet that's been put together by national organizations across the community with specific facts and how to cite them. It's a fantastic resource. Um, we also include donation and transplantation statistics, infographic flyers, and stories of hope to share. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned, we just uh, saw this great proclamation on National Donate Life Month um, come out recently. Um, I just wanna thank all of you for all the amazing things that are happening this month from um, incredible uh, partnerships with local science museums to do stargazing, um, inflatable uh, planetariums, I think people are doing in schools, um, school announcements, just incredible, um, incredible things. So thank you all so much for everything you do. If you need anything, please reach out. Um, Lauren's email, I will drop in the chat. Lauren, DLA, Lauren's email, I don't, <laughs> I'll drop in the chat for customizations um, or any questions that you have on resources or activity ideas. We also do have a recorded webinar um, that is a group conversation that has some great implementation and activity ideas. That's also on um, the DLA um, uh, community.net. If you're looking for any print graphics, Thank you, Marley. If you're looking for any print graphics, um, you can go to the donate let the DLA print shop and order these directly. Table tents, posters, note cards, anything you're looking for there. There's also Lauren's email, but I'll drop it in the chat. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also wanted to show you some uh, promotional items if those are helpful in your outreach and activities. Um, these are some of the great ones you can uh, go ahead and order through the um, member store, Donate Life member store. Next slide, please. Um, and these are all of the links and emails where you can order those directly through our licensed vendor. Next slide, please. And that's it. I hope I stayed on time for you, Marley um, and team. Thank you all so much again for everything you do for National Donate Life Month. Um, and um, we'll take some time for questions now or later, whatever you guys want to do.
I'm going to um, just go ahead and read one. Uh, I apologize um, that I have been unable to hear. Thank you so much for bearing with technical difficulties. I see that there was a question in the chat, um, write a message of hope. Is there a format to submit these to be read or viewed by those waiting? Has this been answered yet? No, it has not been answered yet. Um, I'm happy to answer that. That is, thank you for the question. Um, that is really open to whatever works best for you. We set it up as a great partnership to work um, between uh, donation professionals and transplant programs. Um, oh, I love that. Someone's doing a message of hope and chalk. Beautiful. Thank you. Please send us photos. Um, for the message of hope, however you works best for your organization and local partnerships, those we encourage people through uh, DLA's social media channels to write them, and sometimes they write them just in the comments um, for folks to read. Sometimes it's more if you're doing handwritten notes, and those are sent to a local transplant program that you're partnering with um, for the patients waiting. And sometimes they're, you know, messages of hope for donor families that they, you know, wish them um, ease in their grief and that, you know one day if they want to, to hear from their recipients. So however works best for your um, organization within that. Hillary, we have two other questions. I'm just gonna read off quickly. Sure. Um, they ask, can we use the background with STARS on Teams too? I would assume that your background would work on Teams as well. Yep, 100%. Great. And another question was, how long does it take to get products? Great question. If you are ordering from the public Donate Life store, so that's shopdonatelife.com, those come within days um, because those are already stocked in an inventory. If you are ordering through the member store for quantity, that's a question specifically for the DLA promotions team, and they'll get those to you as quickly as they can. Some things are in stock. Some things may take um, a little bit of time to get to you, depending on the size of the order. But if you let folks know that you need that quickly, um, they'll do their best to get it quickly to you. Any more okay. questions? <laughs> I do not see any more questions, Hillary. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Hillary. Uh, Jenna, are you able to, are you unmuted? I am unmuted. Oh, but you don't hear me. <laughs> oh, I apologize that I am unable uh, to hear anything right now. <laughs> we can hear you. Um, well, I our just next thank I Hillary. I I'm going to hand it over to uh, Jenna right now um, and just let her carry the um, the webinar forward. I'll manage the slides. I got it. Um, so thank you, Hillary, so, so much. It was a great presentation with lots of valuable information. And next, um, we have a presentation um, from Maureen uh, Ryan, who is a living kidney donor. So Maureen, we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, there you thank are. you. Can oh. you hear me? Can someone hear me? Hopefully. Yes. So. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, I'm so happy to be here and glad that I can um, do my part in giving back to all of this amazing work all of you people are doing. Um, I think the outreach campaign is just so important and invaluable and um, all of you are doing such good things to improve lives, save lives. And, and um, I sound like a mom in saying this, but I'm so proud of all of you and hope you know how important it is. Um, and hopefully my story, although it's a little unique because um, I was able to donate to my daughter, um, you can use little tidbits or something in your work that hopefully something that I share today can and help you or maybe understand it a little bit better. Um, and if I, this is my first time ever doing this. Um, so give me a little grace. Um, and if I miss something or don't cover something that you are more interested in, you know, I hope, hopefully Marley um, can give my email out or, cause I'm, I'm, you know, willing to help in any way that I can. Um, the way my family presently is, is trying to give back and become involved is through, um, 
the Gift of Life organization. And that's a website I'm sure you're all familiar with, but it's a huge resource, um, I think, for donors, for recipients, and for advocates like you um, in, in helping people that are donors. There's support, there's ways to get involved. Um, uh, so, th you know, that's, that's one um, thing that I hopefully everyone knows about, but if you don't, you should check out that website. Um, my um, daughter's surgeon, the day before her surgery, which was two years ago, this April, or I'm sorry, this April 12th. So um, I, I feel it's, an, I feel like I've been through um, so much in the past two years, but it's such a happy story that I, I love to tell. I, I get emotional <laughs> talking about it, but it's so important to share. Um, but her surgeon, um, one of the things that stuck with me, he was amazing. He was, um, my daughter was a patient at CHOP and I was with Penn. So if anybody is on here from those hospitals, we had an amazing experience and we're so thankful and grateful. And the surgeon came in the day before her surgery and said to me, um, you know, we're so glad that you could do this. And this type of situation, a mother given to a daughter, is far from easy, but so such a nice process because my daughter didn't have to wait. We were able to schedule it when she needed it. She didn't need to go on dialysis. She, he said, there's, I think the number was like 200,000 people waiting for kidneys. And some of them have been on it for years. Some of them are going on it today. He said, some of them their health is getting worse and they're just waiting and you were able to do this. And you're going to see that after a month or two, your life is going to get back to normal. And because we only need one kidney and more people need to know that. And I think that just hit me like, you know, I heard about kind of organ donation two times in my life at that moment in that year when my daughter got sick. And then when I was 16 and I was getting my driver's license and I could check a box if I could wanted to be an organ donor. And I, and I did, there was nothing in between that. And I think it's so important with what you're all doing to let people know that they can do something like I did and not have their life turned upside down. It might for a few weeks or a few months, but I'm doing everything I did before. Um, and, and I think more people need to know that because it's a topic that comes up when you have a sick family member or friend or someone that needs it, but many people don't know about it. Um, so again, I thank you for, for helping this cause. Um, so a little bit about our story. Um, and Marley, you can, someone can tag me if I'm taking too long or going over or, not covering what I'm supposed to, just to keep me on track. But um, we have, my husband and I have three children. We have a 19-year-old son, a 16-year-old son, and our daughter, Cecilia. She goes by CC. Um, she right now is a freshman. She's 15. And when she was in sixth grade, so three years ago, she went for a well checkup at the hospital or at the, her regular pediatrician. We thought we had a healthy little girl. Um, she was an athlete played basketball and soccer competitively all year long, full-time student. Only thing that her doctor noticed about her at her 12-year-old checkup was um, she was uh, hadn't grown um, the amount that she should have at that age, at 12. So he said, we're just going to do a little blood work, make sure there's nothing going on. And long story short, there was a lot going on and her kidneys were in bad shape. And within 24 hours, we were at CHOP being bounced around nephrology to figure out what was going on with her. In the course of the next um, few weeks, we found out that she had something called um, juvenile nephronophthysis. And it was a kidney disease that um, we were told she would go into kidney failure um, during her teenage years. So shocking. All of our lives got turned upside down very quickly, um, especially for my daughter. Um, we dove right into monthly appointments, um, lots of meds to keep her kidneys doing what they, um, what was left of them. When she was diagnosed, she had 25% function. Um, 
she hadn't had any symptoms, but it was almost like something about that diagnosis triggered things that that was in December, that April, her kidney function had dropped to 15%. And I'm, I'm maybe off in some of my numbers here, I'm not a medical person, but I think 15% was an indicator that her doctors knew at that point she would need a transplant. That was in April and in May, my husband and I began the process to find out if we could be donors. From what I know, at the time when you have somebody willing to become a donor, Penn would send them through um, to begin the process and you kind of go as far as you can get. And if you come up you know, where you can't be one, then they let, allow you to send another family member or a friend through. That year, we were told we were the first couple to be sent in together through the process. I'm not, I don't remember why they allowed it, but we were so grateful. Um, and it was a thorough and, and detailed process, but what we found so um, all necessary. And at the time, as we were doing this, we were also going through the transplant process at CHOP. So lots of appointments, lots of conversations. Um, but from the donor perspective, I want to tell you about my process and, and my husband at the time as well. Um, started with blood work. Um, after I want to say a couple of weeks, there was another deeper round of blood work. So our blood work, our, our match, we were just a match. She was, oh, and both my husband and I were. And so then we got to the next round and then there was another, um, lab drawn that went a little bit deeper following that a few weeks after that, then we were brought in to do, um, again, my medical terminology is not right, but scans um, and MRIs, just to check to make sure we were physically able to, to have a, uh, get through the surgery and that we didn't have any other issues. So there was appointments with cardiologists, scans on all of our organs, and then detailed ones on our specific kidneys. I think they look for if you have only a few amount of arteries connected to your kidney, to the rest, to your body so that it's less invasive. They only want, I want to say one or two arteries. And we were both got through that process besides the physical, um, process of the testing. There's also like, a, I'll say a psychological route. They want to make sure that, um, you're, you're in a healthy mental state to go through all of this. They made sure we weren't being pressured to do it. For me, I was never pressured. We were just praying that one of us was a match. Um, they wanted to know if you have support, um, family support, friend support. You know, as her parents were giving our child support, but they wanted to make sure that my husband and I had that, and 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 we did. Um, they want to make sure you have insurance, you know, so are you financially okay and have insurance to, to support it? Not that it can't happen if you don't have insurance, but it's, it was just lots of questions, lots of interviews, lots um, to, to find out. They went through our family history in depth to find out, um, you know, what, what is, was, did we grow up with or what did our parents and grandparents just in case things comes up were we smokers did we have high blood pressure everything and anything we covered um i had an appointment both of us with social workers just to talk about our story to um, make sure they knew that we were supported by both chop and pen um to help us through it and it was amazing it was um when i look back fairly quick felt like forever because we just wanted the phone call that you're her match. Sorry. We were so lucky that both my husband and I were both matches and we were told we could choose. So my husband said, you're, you're going to be there for when she wakes up to help her recover. I'm going to do this for us. So I was going to let him take this one for the team, but Penn um, sent our blood work to a company that was doing, I want to say newer research, and they were able to dive deeper into our lab work. And when it came back, it showed that I was a slightly better match, that I was just as 
close as I could be to my daughter's, I guess, lab work is what you would say. And they said, you, your husband can still do it. That's okay. He has been approved. Um, but we do have this information. And so we wanted to do what, what was best. And, and so I said, we're not talking about this anymore. I'm doing it. And we found out, I want to see if that process began in May. It was by the fall. So just to give you a time frame of people, if you're working with people that are considering it, it was a few months. Um, and another thing they wanted to make sure we'll be okay taking time off from work. Like I know some people can, and they need to know that I'm a preschool teacher and a, um, a fitness instructor. I teach bar classes. So I was actually able to be back at work six weeks later. And I took about three to four months off from bar before I could go back to that. But literally by August, her surgery was April 12th. By August 12th, I was back doing my fitness workouts. Um, and I finished the school year, um, then had the summer and then went back in the fall. Um, when I talk about the surgery, you can see pictures. Yes, there's my daughter. So, and my husband, um, he stayed with her at in CHOP. I was across the street street at Penn, we had people supporting us. Um, with my husband was Joe DiMartino, who happens to be on this um, webinar as well. He does tons of work for um, organ donation. And he was like a little angel that um, was sent to us. He was a transplant nurse early on in his career and was there to be with my husband to kind of walk him through all of the medical side of this. Cause it's very overwhelming when you see all those machines and everything that she was hooked up to. Um, we were so lucky to have him cause he needed that. And I'm saying that just so that, you know, and working with donors and patients that they need support. And his wife, my sister was with me across the street at, at Penn kind of taking care of us. So um, I was in and out of that hospital at Penn in 48 hours, and I, I, I still can't believe that, um, that that how advanced we are medically, that on uh, Tuesday, I, I donated my kidney, and on Thursday, they were wheeling me over to CHOP so that I could see CC. Um, she was 13 at the time of the uh, surgery. We were able to time it to get the most out of the kidneys um, that she had, but then not to have to go on dialysis. So April 12th was our day. Um, the, re the, the surgery, it was like a well-oiled machine at Penn. Very overwhelming to a teacher, but I felt so well cared for. I felt so supported, um, constantly being checked on by doctors and nurses and follow up after the phone calls and um, even texts, automated texts, just checking in to make sure that I was comfortable and not in pain and doing okay. Um, I uh, I would say the first couple of weeks, you know, were, were tough. They, um, it was, I was recovering from a major surgery, but, um, I was, I stayed at a hotel like three blocks from the, from Penn and Chop. And by the end of the week, I was walking the three blocks to, to come. I, I wasn't supposed to be, my husband was, you know, would come and get me, but when it was one nice morning and I walked and I took a slow walk and I sat on a bench halfway, but it was a beautiful day and, and I could do it. And, and I got there and took a little nap on the bed next to where she was, but that's how amazing it all is that we really don't need another kid two kidneys we you know I was I couldn't do much for her I but I was just there with them and that I think that was the best medicine for me in helping in my recovery just to be able to um be there with her and my husband um we my daughter CC she was there for I think eight days in ICU for four or five um and then was was in you know her regular room whatever you would call it for um another four to five days she when I look at these pictures that, that you're looking at she looks like you know the little girl that she was um she went in I think she was 65 pounds and was four seven very underweight very 
short. Her, her, her kidneys had stopped releasing growth hormones. And that was virtually how our pediatrician figure, figured out that something was going on because she was so little. I'm very short, so wasn't on our radar. But in six months of her getting that kidney, I always tell her it was a super kidney. Um, she grew six inches and I think she put on like 30 pounds and she skipped that awkward time. If any of you have any 12, 13, 14 year olds, you know, when they go through, they're going through puberty, they have so many changes. Literally, we've watched her like go from pale, circles under your eyes, tiny, skinny, and like literally each day after those first few weeks, she blossomed into what you see now is that she's a freshman in high school. That was the formal that she went to this fall. She's playing soccer for her high school team and her club team. Um, she kind of passed by any awkwardness because I think her body was sick um, and she needed this kidney. And it like, it was a um, it wasn't easy on her, so many doctor's appointments, but that was, you know, something that is important. I mean, they were just, it was a relief to be at, back at CHOP and them checking her labs, making sure was everything, everything was okay. They would call that afternoon if tests weren't back when we were there. Um, labs is the way they track it all and to make sure that she's not going into rejection and if there's adjustments that needed to be made and it was, it was amazing. And I will say she's the true hero. Um, I was happy, thrilled, relieved that we could help. Um, what she had to endure was a lot harder. Um, I'm just glad we, we didn't have to go outside of her parents. Um, one thing that I think is an important thing to always remember is my parents or my, um, husband and I were, very much also going to consider um, the donor exchange program that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. It's like if if CC wasn't if we weren't a match for CC, another option for us was um, like we could donate, and somebody else who we were matched with would get that get the kidney, and then it would move our daughter up on a list. Um, and I think that's an important thing for people to know that you don't have to be an exact match to to help your person. Um, we were very lucky. My husband and I could be matches and we had family and friends that wanted to get tested if um, we weren't a match. Um, so we were blessed in so many ways through this process by living so close to Penn and CHOP to having supportive friends, family and a community. And I think that's really can make a, a big difference for people. Um, and um, also, I, I think in my own recovery, and I think it, it helped that, you know, I was highly motivated to be able to take care of my daughter to help my recovery, but I was also taking care of myself ahead of time. I was in good shape, I was active, and I, and I do think that that helped. Um, I think that's all I have. I'm looking at notes. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions or if I, I talk too much, I'll stop. But thank you again for all that you do. And um, I hope that helped you a little bit. Thank you so, so much, Maureen. I cannot tell you how glad I am that I fixed my speakers in order to hear that story. <laughs> um, it was wonderful. And thank you for sharing. Um, if I'll pause just briefly if there's any questions anyone has for Maureen before we continue. Okay, I see just nothing but absolute praise and gratitude for you in the chat, Maureen. Thank you. Okay, up next is our last presentation of the day from Kyla Harris, Coordinator of Public Affairs at LifeLink of Georgia, who has had exceptional success recruiting non-hospital partners in her area to join the donation campaign. Kyla, the floor is yours. Kyla? There we go. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. First, I want to say thank you to Maureen um, for sharing her story. Um, I want to say that it's truly incredible to hear how our mission turns into full circle um, with, with 
the hospitals and the OPOs and doing everything that we can to support um, patients and our donors and donor families. Um, so yeah, it's really incredible to hear, especially on Living Donor Day. Um, and to a point, I do want to say, Hillary, that we are prepared with our glasses for the solar eclipse. Um, so we have a lot of fun activities here at LifeLink going on for um, National Donate Life Month. And so yeah, um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick off the presentation. Um, I am the Public Affairs Coordinator, and I have been with LifeLink for about eight months now. Um, so this is my first National Donate Life Month, and I'm super excited. Um, just wanted to share our mission, vision, and values as LifeLink. Um, our mission is to honor donors and save lives through organ and tissue donation. Our vision is to maximize the gift of life while giving hope to donor families and transplant patients. And of course, our values are compassion, excellence, legacy, people, and quality. Next slide. So where do we serve exactly? Um, we serve all of Georgia, um, and we also have two counties in South Carolina, um, Aiken and Edgefield. Next slide. So a little bit about our workplace partners of LifeLink. Um, we have this, we've had this program for many, many years now, but it kind of has looked different. I know COVID has impacted our ability to kind of partner with businesses and organizations, and now that we're kind of post COVID, we're, we're trying to rebuild and see what works for our program. Um, so we're primarily focused, like, yes, we do work with um, hospitals with the donation campaign and everything, but we're primarily focused on, um, again, like any types of businesses, organizations, um, and nonprofits as well. Next slide. Um, so the Workplace Partners um, really is an effort of public education. These businesses and um, organizations already have current efforts, um, whether it be a lunch and learn or a webinar or a health fair. Um, and so our job is to come in and kind of just uh, publicly educate, set up a table or kind of um, give a, a speech or you know, present them with volunteers that we have. And most of our volunteers um, do have a connection to donations. So it's really uh, powerful for them that, to come and table and interact with different businesses in the community. Um, and so basically I'm gonna walk you through our process. Um, first, we invite you know, businesses and organizations to visit our uh, foundation website page at www.lifelinkfoundation.org. Um, we encourage them to review our workplace partners brochure, which will be on the next few slides. And we also have a workplace partners application, which really isn't an application. Like it's just really filling out you know, your information, where you're located, um, what kind of efforts you want to see happen with our partnership. Um, and then you also will, our workplace partners receive campaign materials, which also we'll see in a couple of slides. Um, and then again, hosting events, it's the main thing that we're, we're looking to do. We want to um, kind of expand this life-saving message of organ and tissue donation, and we want to encourage continuous partnership. Like we don't want to just have one event, we're trying to make it yearly. We want to come back and, and, and really build on that partnership so that it can lead to other, um, you know, awareness efforts. Next slide. So here's our brochure um, and it kind of gives you a backdrop on like some organ and tissue donation facts. Um, and then it also lets you know about our service areas. Again, we do have um, other service areas in Florida and Puerto Rico, but I, we're focused kind of on um, our Georgia one since we are in Georgia. Um, next slide. So it basically gives you the, the um, spiel on why you should become a workplace partners and how it'll enhance your current um, healthcare efforts, as well as implementation ideas of how you can kind of participate. We do have a program benefit section in here um, that's kind of in regards to the HRSA um, tiers. Uh, we're trying to model it after HRSA's program, but it isn't quite um, elevated right now. We're still in the works of kind of the bronze, the silver, and the gold um, recognition, but we are using HRSA as a framework for that, and we hope in the future to um, kind of get that going. And then it also gives you some donation um, education information as well. So we really encourage, um, you know, our workplace partners when they're joining it, to kind of read over this and see if it's something that really interests them and if they are able and willing to commit to this. Um, next slide. Again, this is still um, going over implementation ideas, um, benefits that you get from our partnership and also donation uh, facts. Next slide. 
So I wanted to kind of walk you through what it would look like if you were to become a workplace partner for LifeLink. And so this is just a screen snip of our uh, LifeLink Foundation website. We do have a tab at the top that says community partners. When you hit that, um, you'll see the little button to scroll to workplace partners. Next. And then this was the application that I mentioned where you're filling out, you know, which LifeLink office is closest to you, contact name information, and then towards the bottom of it, it kind of asks you what is it that you're looking to do um, and how, and ways that you're trying to implement um, this program into your uh, business or your organization. Next slide. So this is, um, once the, the application is filled out, we do send them we, in the mail, we um, mail them a certificate and this is basically just establishing their dedication to saving lives, organ and tissue donation, and ed educating others on the greatest gift. Um, and then as well as we send a letter. This is just an example letter that I sent to the um, City of Decatur Fire Rescue. And it's just thanking them again for signing up, filling out that application. Um, and it's also giving you know, some contact information. Um, and next slide. So once they receive that, uh, they do have my, my contact information in the uh, letter that we send, but I like to personally follow up. So I do give them a phone call and I pretty much introduce myself and I try to set a meeting to establish kind of like, hey, what is your vision for this? How can we get started? Do you have any dates in mind? Um, and so I, I also tell them, you know, hey, if you have a health benefits fair, if you have a lunch and learn, if you want us to come and set up an informational table, we can provide volunteers for that as well. There's even custom programs. Um, we have a few partners that kind of don't have that many people in office because some of them are remote or majority of them are remote. Um, so we also offer kind of like, hey, if you want computer screens or monitors or screen savers, or if you wanna do a, um, maybe it's a monthly email blast, um, we can provide materials for that as well. Next slide. And here are a couple of our partners. Um, I am currently working on all of these, but uh, some really cool ones, Walgreens. I actually went there, I wanna say two weeks ago, and that was our kickoff. We've secured dates for the entire year and each location are in our low registration areas. So we're really aiming to be out and present in the community and kind of debunk some of those myths or misconceptions. Um, and Walgreens is the perfect place. I, I can't imagine how many people walk into Walgreens in an entire day. Um, but I know for that first interaction, I was there personally and I had some amazing conversations. It was really impactful. So I'm really proud of that, um, that partnership with them. I know we go to Coca-Cola, Henry's Louisiana Grill is a proud um, partner of ours, Augusta Aviation. We're going to the YMCA in a couple of weeks, which I'm super excited for. Um, we do have the Georgia Public Library and again, the Decatur uh, Fire Department. And Gas South, we actually have, I believe it's on the 20th, and that's going to be a huge thing with, uh, I believe it's 165 employees that are going to be present um, at the Hyatt House. So I'm super excited to kind of, you know, start that conversation um, and see what the community kind of needs as far as public education. Next slide. So I do have some top tips here. Um, kind of wrote them down. So. My main thing, um, again, since I'm new, I'm, I'm eight months in and I'm learning what's working and what's not working. But from what I've seen, um, it's really important to work with different departments within your organization. Um, and I can give you an example of like going to purchasing and asking like, hey, who are our newest vendors or recent vendors that we've had? And kind of seeing like reaching out and saying like, hey, how many people do you have in your organization? Do you guys currently have you know, any health um, initiatives? Can we be a part of it? Can we get the table? Like, what can we do um, to kind of partner with you guys and get the word out? I think that's a, a great way to kind of jump kick some of your workplace partners. Um, another thing is networking, establishing relationships and building rapport in your communities. Um, I mean, like Chamber of Commerce has been excellent. We, we are part of many chambers and just going there to their events and attending and speaking and giving out your business card and kind of starting that conversation there works really well. Um, and then timely follow-up. So once you have a workplace partner that's um, you know, committed in doing their lunch and learns or whatever event that they have, actually taking the time to give them a phone call after, or send an email um, and kind of just following up, hey, how did the event go? What do you think we can do better? Um, and having that, try to get that next event booked kind of. Um, 
like asking, hey, can we do this next year? Is this an annual thing? Or are you thinking, can we start doing it quarterly? Um, that seems to work really well so that you can keep it going. Again, we wanna have, we wanna be present and active and not just have it, that relationship just kind of fall. Um, and then I take all of these things in and evaluate, right? So I take the feedback into consideration and I help it mold my program. Um, and I can kind of implement it towards other workplace partners and say, hey, here's what works for this one. Um, maybe we want to kind of not have to reinvent the wheel and we can go with something similar that another partner did. So those are kind of my things that I'm learning right now. Hopefully this list will grow. I'm sure it will. But um, this is just the beginning, again, of Workplace Partners for LifeLink. Next slide. So here's my little roadmap. Um, basically, past is the past. We're post-COVID now. Um, and so looking into the future, I really have been going through our list. I want to say we have a list of about, I want to say well over, let's say well over 90 workplace partners. Um, and I've been going through that list contacting and some of them are from like 2017 or previous years. And I just want to see what, when's the last time we were active, right? And what, what are we doing to kind of rebuild that relationship and say, hey, we're here. We want to be a part of um, you guys' you know, initiatives again. Um, so that's kind of what I've been working on. I do have plans to implement a quarterly newsletter. And uh, if you don't have a newsletter already set up, a great resource is Constant Contact. We've been piloting that in a couple of different um, programs here at LifeLink. It is phenomenal. It is just truly amazing what you can do with that. Um, so I'm looking forward to starting that up. I think that'll uh, help engagement as well. If, if you're seeing kind of the events in a newsletter and you're like, wow, like I see what they're doing. I wanna do that and be a part of it. I think that'll help build that relationship as well. Um, we wanna implement a, uh, the scorecard as well, modeling uh, HERS's current scorecard. I think it's a phenomenal concept and I think it's a great way to keep workplace partners engaged. Um, so we're definitely looking into that and what kind of criteria we'd like to model, we'll, we'll pull from that. Um, and then I would love to do something honoring this, right? Like a lot of great work in the community and having us come out and kind of keeping up with all the events. Cause we know people, you have your everyday role and your job that you do, but taking on something additional, it's amazing. It's incredible and it should be valued and honored. And so I think having maybe an annual banquet where I invite all of the workplace partners to come and I give out maybe like awards or little trinkets or special goodies, um, letting them know like, hey, you guys are appreciated and we really value the partnership and we wanna continue this. I think that's something that uh, we'd love to kick off soon here. So still in the works of that again, but looking forward to all of these great things in the future. Next slide. And thank you. So if you scan this QR code, you'll get my contact information. It's also listed here as well. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out. I'm always here. And yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, Marley and Bree. Um, it's been wonderful to be able to talk to you guys today. Thank you so much, Kyla, especially seeing how you've customized recognition to support the partners and really make it meaningful to them. That's wonderful to see. Thank you, thank you. Um, are there any questions for Kyla for any of our presenters today? Um, I know that we're a little over time, but I certainly don't want to uh, cut off the opportunity for you to get your questions answered. No questions? Okay. If any come up, you are welcome to reach out to our presenters as with the at the information they've provided, as well as to email uh, the donation campaign. Um, we'll be sharing that information shortly. I just want to thank you all so much for your time today, um, your time spent on donation and the work you're doing to make lives better across the country. Lauren, would you like to close out today's meeting? Sure, I will close out very quickly. Um, thank you all for hanging on after three o'clock. We had some really wonderful presentations today. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Hillary, Kyla, especially thank you, Maureen, for that touching story. I'm sure your story is inspiring more mothers and more people in general um, to consider living donation as an option to save lives. Thank you all for sharing your experience and expertise with us. And thank you for everyone who was able to join for making time for today's webinar. Um, your involvement is really what makes donation work. And we're grateful for your support and commitment to the cause of signing up new organ, eye and tissue donors. Just a quick plug before I let everyone go. Uh, go. 
HRSA's Health Systems Bureau and Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs is going to be holding a webinar for National Donate Life Month on April 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern. The webinar is going to delve more broadly into organ donation and transplantation beyond donation, and will also uh, feature a testimonial from a kidney recipient and living kidney donor. So look for an e-blast invitation to that webinar that's going to be coming into your inbox soon. I hope you all can join us. Happy National Donate Life Month, and um, good luck in all of the activities that you'll all be executing this month and beyond. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day.